now, it seems like yesterday to me it was made, but it's now nine years old. And uh, yeah, I, I really relate to the sense of optimism that was expressed at the end of the film also, because very often every anniversary there's a kind of surge of international and local and national in India attention. And people think that things are changing, it certainly feels like that. Um, but here we are nine years later and nothing substantive has shifted, but that's not the whole story because um, not all of the optimism in the film was completely misplaced by any means. Uh, because six months after the anniversary scenes that you saw, um, Bhopal suddenly became a major national political issue in India. Um, on the back of the criminal prosecution of uh, seven remaining Indian accused in the ongoing criminal trial. Um, so they were given um, two-year sentences uh, under charges of criminal negligence. And uh, from that moment, a furore uh, erupted in India uh, on the issue of the um, iniquities and depredations of the entire 25 and more years. Um, so suddenly, the Congress government at the time had to look like it was serious about doing something about the, uh, you know, these um, uh, ongoing injustices. So as a consequence of the furore, it lasted for about two or three months. Suddenly, Bhopal was a major election issue in the Congress party at the time. The individual ministers were being held to account on a regular basis, and obviously the opposition parties were making a lot of capital out of it. But um, the Indian government was forced to start talking uh, as though it was going to seriously go after Dow Chemical, uh, which until that time was proceeding unmolested uh, and expanding its business in India, apart from actions by survivors and their uh, uh, and affiliated groups. Um, so they, uh, ministers started talking openly about trying to prosecute Dow for the contamination issue, trying to go after them for the criminal case. And uh, this provoked um, a response that was leaked to the press from one of President Obama's national security advisors. And it was, it was an explicit threat to India's finance minister that the US would withhold its cooperation on an international grant that India was due to receive on the back of the Dow Chemical issue, quote. Um, he basically said, uh, I hope well, we hope this is not going to create a chilling effect on our investment and trade relationship. So, so this was a communication that was leaked to the press. And it gave a window, really, into uh, what, what at that time was, was a very unclear uh, level of uh, US governmental obstructionism and complicity in the obstruction of justice for the, for the survivors. Uh, and it's an issue that's become clearer in the intervening years since the film was made. Um, and I'd like to talk more about that if, if people are interested uh, when we do a Q&A session. Um, the, uh, as a result of the Indian government having to uh, you know, take action in 2010-2011, it also filed several petitions in the courts. Um, one of them has actually led to a potential revival of the uh, scandalous and treacherous out of court settlement from 1989 that realised, uh, as you saw from the film, uh, compensation payouts of about $500 per, per victim. And 94% of the victims got figures that low from the compensation settlement. Um, so there is a, an action in India Supreme Court that is pending, uh, and it's, it's called the curative petition, civil curative petition. And in that petition, India is seeking an extra $1.2 billion in compensation from Down Union Carbide. So this case, uh, assuming it makes progress, has the potential to realize um, much needed monies for relief and rehabilitation measures in the city. Uh, and I heard just yesterday that the current Indian government has just filed an urgent application for hearing in that case. It's been languishing in the Supreme Court without being heard for about seven years. And the survivor groups are participants in the, uh, they have legal status to, uh, to add their arguments to the case the government's put forward. Um, the, uh, what happened in 2010 also revived the pressure on Indian authorities to um, seriously pursue the criminal case against the foreign accused who have been absconding since 1992 
and as a result of that, Scotland, Union, an attachment order was issued against Union Carbide property, uh, which, unbeknownst to anyone in, uh, or, or unbeknownst to the main, main population in India, Union Carbide set about circumventing immediately by s establishing a third party <coughs> trading entity uh, through which they were able to funnel goods and services to Indian companies under cover of a different guise uh, to avoid attachment of their properties. Um, that's been brought into the civil curatives, a clear act of fraud and potentially allows parties to um, seek a way to pierce the corporate veil between Dow and Union Carbide. Um, but the, the criminal cases uh, since the film was made realised uh, five different summons for Dow Chemical which, which went through official governmental channels in India and the US, none of which have actually been physically served on Dow Chemical by the US Department of Justice. Although India has a, uh, an international law treaty to do with um, mutual assistance, mutual legal assistance on criminal matters, the Department of Justice has completely ignored its obligations under the aegis of that international law and framework and failed to serve any of those notices on Dow Chemical. Um, but the case continues and it continues to make life very uncomfortable for Dow. And the good news is that. Uh, whereas when the film was made in 2009, Dow was attempting to establish and open a brand new R&D center in Maharashtra in India. Uh, they were attempting to make a major investment in Gujarat with, a, with an Indian uh, part state-owned company. Um, the, the actions of uh, survivor groups, of, of grassroots organizations in different parts of India, and also the intervention of one or two political figures um, actually resulted in the company having to roll back those investments, losing something in the order of $375 million in the process. And uh, we understand from private conversations that we know that the Dow Chemical CEO had just quite recently, Dow has been absolutely unable, unable to pursue a direct investment program in India. It's a market that's expanding at a huge rate, equivalent to the market expansion in China. So it's having a direct impact on the company's bottom line, their inability to proceed with investments in this booming marketplace. Um, so in other words, it's a real and live issue for them that although on the surface they're continuing to ignore, it's actually presenting extreme, extremely problematic strategic problems. Um, the other good news, uh, the film covered some scenes in uh, one of the clinics that our charity uh, Bhopal Medical Appeals, a UK based charity, supports from here, um, Chingari. At, at that time, uh, they were in a very small building. They were only able to see a, a dozen or two dozen children every day. Um, that organisation is now over 10 years old and they're uh, providing essential services in the form of physiotherapy, speech therapy, special education. Um, uh, a, a nutrition program, etc., to over 250 children every day. Um, these are damaged kids from the worst impact of communities, kids who are uh, born to either water or gas affected parents, sometimes both. Uh, these are kids that have nowhere else to go, they have no other services of that nature to turn to. And the successes they've been having are quite extraordinary. Something like 85 children from Chingari have now been able to attend normal schools and uh, 96 kids, there was a, a very moving moment when a mother expresses the wish that her child could walk. Chingari has helped 96 children to walk for the first time in their lives. Um, I, I recently wrote up a story of a boy called Suraj who we first met in 2007. Um, he was severely, um, he had a, a very severe version of cerebral palsy and uh, up until the age of 18, he'd never walked a, a step in his life and hadn't spoken a single word. And last year, at the age of 19, Chingari enabled him to say his mother's name for the first time and to walk the first steps of his life. And um, he's now walking about 20 steps. He's interacting with staff at the clinic. And uh, he's been now got a vocabulary of about 15 words. So things are happening and, and uh, you know, at the ground level, really, uh, encouraging kind of changes being made to individual people's lives by the uh, survivor groups uh, who have effectively had to take matters into their own hands. Um, okay, I'm going to round up and, and uh, 
open up to questions. You mentioned um, that that's a good insight into the kind of judgment justice and the involvement here. Could you go into that a little bit more? Yes. Um, I mean, effectively, uh, because of the, the terms of the legal treaty, I, I mean, just to roll back a second, so um, the, the statement by Obama's National Security Advisor was, was one of the first publicly available documents uh, that we had access to which showed clear uh, you know, threat making on behalf of the US government. Uh, we've since kind of um, gathered more circumstantial evidence. There were uh, a number of cables that came through WikiLeaks which showed uh, diplomatic activity that was designed to thwart progress in the, in the legal cases in Bhopal. And we also got access to State Department cables from the 1970s, um, which showed that the US government was actually uh, directly involved in uh, lobbying Indian government ministers to obtain licensing uh, for the plant at the build stage. So th there's a good chance that the factory never would have been built had it not been for the intervention of US diplomatic officials, and in particular, um, Henry Kissinger, who uh, was head of the US State Department at that time. And he facilitated a, a loan from a US um, export bank, the Exim Bank, that went to Union Carbide. And that loan actually enabled uh, Union Carbide India to be retained as a majority equity subsidiary of Union Carbide Corporation USA. Now that's important because um, the Union Carbide's management system was designed to achieve centralized, integrated management control of its overseas affiliates, and it was accomplishing that by maintaining majority equity. And uh, the company's majority holding in, in its Indian subsidiary was threatened at that time by Indian foreign exchange regulations from the early 70s. So the US government facilitated Union Carbide's circumvention of Indian regulations in order to retain majority equity control, but also to proceed with building this ultra-hazardous factory in the middle of a majorly populated city. Um, now, Henry Kissinger pops up again because in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, he, he by then formed a consultancy called Kissinger Associates, uh, which included amongst its fellows a number of uh, individuals who would go on to serve under Reagan administrations in senior roles. Um, and uh, Union Carbide hired them uh, from December the 11th. And when uh, Lawrence Eagleburger, for example, was put forward for the U.S. State Department uh, role in, the, in, in around 1990, Union Carbide gave him a personal reference for his FBI inquiry. Yeah? So uh, he served as uh, head of state at exactly the same time that India was starting to pursue the criminal charges against the foreign accused. And we then find out that uh, from members of the Indian investigative pre-services at the time, the CBI, which is an Interpol agency. Um, we, we spoke to the former head of that agency who went on record to say that he had been explicitly ordered by an Indian ministry at that time not to pursue the foreign accused through the criminal case, you know, to, to basically put a block on those investigations. And two other heads of the CBI from a similar period came forward to say they, they'd undergone the same treatment. So we start to see a picture of US governmental pressure and then outcomes at an Indian national policy level. Um, when, uh, when the court in Bhopal was pursuing the criminal summons against Dow Chemical between 2014 and 2017, um, and these summons were being put through official channels, the Dow Chemical CEO, Andrew Laveras, visited uh, President Obama's White House more than 50 times in that period as a personal visitor of Obama. And um, it's, it's on the White House logs, you know, I've, I've verified this. And um, uh, yeah, he was such a special friend of Obama, he was being invited to uh, functions of state. You know, if, if the Canadian Prime Minister came on a state visit, Laveras was among a select group of people invited to greet him and uh, share drinks with the, the, you know, the visiting dignitary. So, um, quite clearly, Dow Chemical have been cultivating a strong relationship with, um, with that administration. But it goes back because um, 
quite apart from an old Lawrence Siegel burger under Reagan. There were eight years after that under President Bill Clinton when Bill Clinton's best friend in Washington was a lawyer called Vernon Jordan, um, who didn't have an official role in Washington but uh, was effectively a go-between and Clinton's kind of right-hand man. And he served on the board of a number of US corporations, one of whom was Union Carbide. So during that entire period of time when the Indian government uh, and the Indian courts were foot-dragging over rigorously and vigorously pursuing the criminal case against the foreign accused, there was a Union Carbide chairper, chairman, uh, sorry, not chairman, a director, uh, whispering in the ear of the US president over that eight years. When George W. Bush got into power in 2001, um, the, uh, he had considered the Dow Chemical, another Dow Chemical director at the time, they'd just taken over Carbide, as his vice presidential running mate, another Dow Chemical um, board member, Barbara Franklin, raised $25 million for his presidential campaign. So the ties between the companies and the various US administrations was incredibly deep. Yeah. Um, we tried to, we used right to information to try to get documents out of US governmental sources to, to verify some of our suspicions about the extent of the obstruction and we've only been successful in uh, getting about 24 pages of documents over hundred, out of hundreds of files. The rest have either been refused uh, access, we've been refused access or they've been heavily redacted. So they're, they're, they're clearly covering something up. Um, in the film, uh, the layperson is, uh, feels like it's common sense, the, the, the emotional point that, that there's an obvious connection between the release of the gas and uh, the injury suffered by um, you know, the death of the injury suffered by children. Uh, so, one of the injuries suffered by children, the only reference I called in the film was a statistical reference. Uh, is that, have there been any uh, studies to, uh, that, that would? Uh, but crudely stand up before the law to show the uh, connection between these uh, health, these major disabilities, uh, and uh, and the release of gas, uh, particularly on these on these young children. Yeah, um, that's a good question, and um, it's been incredibly difficult to get uh, solid, substantial information on on that issue over the years, uh, and I'll explain why. Um, there were a number of pr preliminary and fairly small studies undertaken by an Indian government agency called the Indian Council of Medical Research in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. That was from 1985 onwards. So they, they looked at um, uh, impacts in particular on uh, genetic material in gas survivors. So they identified breaks and uh, problems with chromosomes in a, in a select group that were at breaks three or four times the, or the, the uh, unaffected population. And they followed that up and found developmental disorders in a number of children who'd been born subsequent to their parents being gas exposed. Some of them were, were in the womb at the time of their parents' gas exposure. And um, there was a subsequent study that wasn't published, but the, the problem was in the early 1990s, the government uh, ceased in uh, funding and effectively wound up a program of 24 different medical studies. Um, and put a ban on their public uh, uh, publication. And this was at a time when the government was still getting heat from the uh, outrageous terms that it agreed for the civil settlement of the Union Carbide, having, having been effectively bullied into it uh, by the, the company's attempts to uh, threaten breach of due process in the Union courts. Um, you know, so that it was a Sort of, kind of sort of Damocles that they'd managed to acquire through a, a preliminary uh, kind of process in the U.S. courts, uh, where the U.S. courts had effectively said that uh, if their due process rights were breached in the Indian context, then potentially they could bring the case back to the U.S. Uh, forum. Um, so you know the, the, these preliminary studies were quite small in, in, in nature. We only found out about uh, nine months ago that the state government had initiated its own program of study and had identified two and a half thousand developmental disorders in the 1990s, to which it, it had attempted to address with a, with a short program of um, uh, addressing cyanotic, cyanotic heart defects. 
Uh, so around 36 kids got heart operations at that time, paid for by the state authorities. Uh, but after that was virtually nothing. But the clinic that we support in Bhopal, Sambhavna, uh, which has been um, uh, in place now since 1996, 22 years old, has deep ties in the affected communities because it's had a program of community outreach work for uh, over two decades also, has had itself undertaken a massive epidemiological study uh, which began around five or six years ago. Um, so they um, have taken in uh, over 20,000 families, uh, rigorous, rigorously taken data on all kinds of conditions of 20,000 families uh, one of which is a control group, of course. There are, there are groups uh, who are uh, gas-affected, gas and water-affected, water-affected control group. Um, and uh, the, the, the data is being processed through uh, uh, internet by international experts, and we're hoping that eventually the data is going to make it into um, peer-reviewed international journals um, sometime, hopefully, before the 35th anniversary next year. Um, but preliminary findings in that data suggest that uh, developmental disorders, birth defect, congenital disorders are running at rates four or five times the national average in the uh, affected communities. Yes? Hi. Um, what do you see? Like, is there a role? Like, what's the role of international law going forward in this case? So mm. I'm thinking we have an issue that India doesn't come within like, a strong regional human rights system. So this case can't go to like the ECHR in Europe or like the American or human rights. Um, obviously, you would have an issue with like the ICC, you can take it there. And with the ICJ, I was thinking you were talking about there was um, there's a bilateral treaty between the US and India concerning... Um, Assist mutual assistance yeah, on criminal matters. With that, could that be a case? I mean, I know this is one really small part of this whole criminal mm. proceeding, but could that go to ICJ? Has that been a consideration? Or it, it's would it be helpful? Or? It certainly hasn't been investigated, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm something of a dilettante on the subject of international law. And there is somebody in the room that would be able to, uh, I think, you know, speak much more clearly and uh, with knowledge than I can on the subject, but. Um, uh, you know, my understanding, uh, and it's a crude one, is that there, there is no international law mechanism in existence through which, um, you know, any of these matters could actually be subject to judicial proceeding. Uh, they simply don't exist. You know, there, there have been attempts, obviously, to, um, uh, through international agencies like the UN in recent years, to try and create a framework by which um, judicial mechanisms can be created, but the last such effort resulted in the Global Compact uh, that the UN agreed in 2011, which you're probably familiar with, yeah, which is a set of guidelines and procedures which are not legally enforceable. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's that's my crude understanding, but I'm, you know, I'm open to... There's cases that really hinges on the, the huge issue of the social law that there is a huge lack there's a complete lack of accountability for non-state actors. Absolutely. Um, and you know, what they were saying about how they don't, they don't, this company don't see themselves as being um, liable under US yeah. jurisdiction, or India jurisdiction, which yeah. obviously, I mean, it's totally ridiculous. I mean, they do come within both jurisdictions in different, different areas. But, yes. um, they're really acting with impunity. Precisely. Um, in the yeah. same way that Shell has been Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. And I guess also maybe one of the, one of the reasons it's been so hard um, to really get anywhere across the criminal proceeding kind of with the international, the, the foreign nationals involved, is because this would set such a large international precedent, and that's really not what people want, what a lot of people want. Thanks, you've just basically given my response for me yeah. because um, no, you've hit the nail on the head in, yeah. in several directions. Yeah. You know, just on the question of the jurisdiction, I mean, I did a job myself in international law, you know. Uh, um, it's absolutely right that there, are, that there is no forum, it's as simple as that. Certainly, as far as the ICJ is concerned, um, I think you're right that um, 
uh, basically it's a question of states. Uh, we have um, uh, the opportunity to uh, take cases and then with the agreement of the other side in any case. So, of course, your point is entirely right but, um, as far as non state actors are concerned. But in a way, I think that international law is a bit of a red herring here. The, the, the issue is uh, that uh, it took place in, uh, in India and uh, the jurisdiction of uh, in India is frankly self-evident. I don't think you have to be a lawyer, let alone an international lawyer, to appreciate that. And uh, uh, that is where inter international law comes in politically. That, uh, the, the, the American government has demonstrated uh, well in the film uh, and by Tim's presentation uh, uh, is um, being enormously uh, influential, to put it politely, uh, in uh, persuading the Indian government to uh, not to uh, pursue it, and uh, you know, the, yeah. the Indian court, uh, hence the uh, absurd settlement was made many years ago. Uh, that's, and that is international law for you in a way, because international law is highly political and uh, extremely amorphous, extremely amorphous. I'm sure you appreciate to quite put your feet on it. In, in, in most cases, let alone in a case like this. Yes, yes um, I agree with the uh, previous comment made and uh, it's a very important film that you've shown. Um, what I would say is that uh, perhaps one area where we should at least at an academic level be kind of uh, cross-connecting is that you know, it has parallels with so many areas, you know, obviously Fukushima, uh, most obviously because those reactors in Fukushima were actually American reactors. And in America, when those reactors were being developed in the 60s, they actually had research which suggested that they were prone to meltdown, and that was actually suppressed. And when they were sold to the Japanese, they were sold on zero warranty. But actually, the Indians, when they bought reactors from uh, America, they didn't buy them on the zero warranty basis. They, they bought them specifically on on you know the polluter paying principle and all the rest of it. Yes. And yet this whatever relationship they had in this case has not served them and they clearly sold their population out because you know they had they had the uh, you know Anderson and the like in, in a cell and they obviously let him go and they would have known that he's going to have gone. But for me what is really revealing about this whole panoply of events is that, you know, it raises questions about our democratic culture, because if you take the UK as an instance, very few people in England or in wider nations, Scotland, Wales, would know that we have the highest stockpiles of plutonium in the whole wide world. You know, we have 40% of the plutonium in the whole wide world. And the reason why we don't know is because the industry and the state operates in collusion and they suppress this kind of information and this is how we are governed. In India, it's not dissimilar to the UK, it's not yes. dissimilar to uh, China or to the US or Russia or whatever. And yet, whenever we have research symposia, we always contrast the Koreans, the North Koreans and the Russians from ourselves. But actually, what is most definable is how in coalition we all are in our various govern governments. So, and yeah, I mean, I can't but agree with uh, much of what you say, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, you know, one, of the, one of the activists put it really well. It was at a time when the, when the buzzword for sort of international economics and law and processes was globalization. And he said that you know an incident, incident like Bhopal provides a window into the process of globalisation. That still pertains, I think. Um, I'm interested in how the sort of the whole the rough approach building was uh, allocated. How that was that? Uh, what was the split between actually uh, most of it went directly to suppliers? But then was some of that put towards trying to clean up and what kind of efforts have they made in that? Or have they made in that area? No, no. Um, you know, mu much of the uh, rehabilitation cost of Bhopala has been socialised. It's fallen upon the Indian taxpayer uh, because the 
national government has had to give, uh, I think at last estimate, around $350 million. Uh, it's given that to the state government to put into rehabilitation schemes. So economic, social rehabilitation, there hasn't been, there's been hardly anything spent on environmental rehabilitation, and that, that only through um, Supreme Court initiatives in the last five or six years. Uh, and then, you know, it was a very uh, hodgepodge kind of effort where, I, I, and I'm not exaggerating here, uh, uh, an Indian company called Ramki used women in saris with handmade brooms to sweep pesticide dust out of the warehouses on the site. You know, this, this was hexachlorocyclohexane particles that were being thrown up into the air by people with no protective clothing whatsoever. Um, that's, that's the extent of the Indian government's cleanup effort. Basically, they moved the waste that were on the surface that were already containing buildings into one other building. Nothing's been done about the real problem, which is under the ground, where the company was uh, indiscriminately dumping it and burying it while the factory was in operation. Um, yeah. It's, it's been done into like an approximate cost of what it's going to take to get it anyway. The Indian government has, has blocked um, international agencies in recent years from figuring out how much it's going to cost because it's a it's never expanding problem. In the film, yeah. it was mentioned that the contamination is three kilometres out. Um, just just a year ago, Sambhavna submitted water tests to the Supreme Court which showed that there were uh, industrial contaminants used in processes of the factory more than five kilometres out now in community well water. And um, so from, from it, the Supreme Court had accepted 22 communities were um, exposed to contaminants through their water supplies. It's, from, that, from those tests, it's gone up to 42. It's almost doubled. So it's now over 100,000 people that are reached by the contamination. Yeah. And um, no, the Indian government's put barely a penny into that. But they have put into rehabilitation schemes, economic and social and medical, because they've been funding medical care. Uh, but that's that, the treatment symptom, right? Not the cause. Like, ab until absolutely. you deal with the cause of the, the, the source, you're, you're just going to blast on the cup, you know? Yes. The other issue. Yes. I'm I sure there's more immediate tangible benefits from dealing with people, but until you just quell the flow of chemical gas. Yes, the ongoing exposure. Yeah, but also there's the fact that MIC exposure, one time MIC exposure in 1984 caused um, profound impacts on the entire system. I mean, that, that has come out of the medical studies that have been released from the 80s and the, and the 90s. So it, MIC crossed the pulmonary barrier, got into the bloodstream, went around the body, uh, hitched onto a protein called uh, uh, glucosamine, I think it was. Uh, I could be wrong there. But then sort of broke down in different parts of the body was damaged. So we're seeing lots of kidney and liver damage now. Uh, obviously cancers are hugely on the rise and Sambhavna has been documenting some of that. The official cancer registry, the state run cancer registry has been uh, deliberately downplaying the figures and, and finessing the data uh, as well. And there's evidence of that. Um, yeah, so, so the Indian government has you know, spent not far off the money that Union Carbide provided in reparation and in, in a one-time settlement, um, and the money that went to survivors, you know, they got in the end they got two payments of five hundred dollars each, because interest accumulated over fifteen years. It took so long. The disbursement scheme and categorisation scheme took so long. Uh, the survivors were still receiving compensation, something like eighteen, nineteen years after Union Carbide had paid it, had paid that money in nineteen eighty-seven. Has there been much involvement in large international NGOs? Um, I think it's a environment to be like Greenpeace or whatever. Yes, I mean, I mean Greenpeace, um, Greenpeace did the first major uh, study of the uh, contaminants in 1999. So, um, you know, that study was incredibly important at the time. They, they made some follow up studies and gave some recommendations and brought in some reputable scientists. Um, but then they abandoned the campaign in about 2002, and they haven't really looked at it since. Uh, um, they just moved on, you know, policy, they moved away from toxics uh, at that time, and they haven't really come back. They, they weren't particularly respectful, to be honest, of the 
local, the grassroots communities at the time either. You know, they, they effectively plastic Greenpeace branding over everything they did in Bhopal and, um, you, you know, kind of tended to blank out the work that communities were doing on, on exposing these issues. Um, so it wasn't a great collaboration, but we've had, we had much better experiences with Amnesty International who have been um, you know, working with these survivor organisations since around 2002, 2003 to uh, produce reports, studies that uh, you know, stand up to uh, scrutiny and um, you know, cover the extent of the impacts on you know, a broad range of human rights. Um, you know, but, but, but also, you know, Amnesty are, are limited in terms of the amount of time and resources they can give an issue like this, which is now 34 years old. Yeah. So, um, so the, you know, in terms of ongoing support, no. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the UN's current special rapporteurs, uh, Basco Tunsat, has been very helpful. He's a rapporteur on um, hazardous waste. And um, he's made some very strong statements, and, and he was involved in an effort to get the United Nations Environmental Programme to go to Bhopal to, to do a thoroughgoing scientific assessment of the contamination. So UNEP actually agreed and committed to doing that, uh, but they needed to take permission from the Indian government. And uh, uh, that, I think it was two and a half years ago now, they wrote to the relevant ministry and they were refused permission outright without any explanation to go to Bhopal to conduct that testing. So without, in the absence of a picture of the spread of the contamination, no work can begin to, uh, begin to remediate it. Politically, uh, are, are the um, survivors uh, politically organised at all? And uh, if so, uh, have they had any success at all in uh, elections, either in the Indian state elections or in the national elections, of uh, people who are genuinely sympathetic to the settlement? Yes, um, I think um, cer certainly in the early years, you know, Bhopal was a uh, was was a major issue at national level. So a number of uh, large, you know, high status Indian national politicians got involved in uh, trying to move things at parliamentary level, um, and uh, you know, bringing about rallies, trying to move things at a legislative level as well. The uh, Indian got its own India got its Environment Act in 1987, which in part was, you know. Uh, a response to Bhopal, but there are also other less obvious legislative changes that happened. But uh, certainly over the last couple of decades there have been some politicians who have run against the grain. There was a Minister of Chemicals and Fertilisers who um, uh, had, was a real thorn in the side of Dow Chemical for the years that he was in power because he was responsible for putting an application into the State High Court that Dow pay a sum of money, $22 million, in lieu of determination of liability to begin the process of decontaminating the plant. Dow, of course, haven't paid that money, so that's still pending in the uh, High Court. Um, yeah, but, uh, and, and he also was involved in uh, refusing permission for investment projects as well. Uh, so he was something of a bet noir for, for Dow for a number of years. Uh, and, and then, uh, most recently, uh, survivor organizations um, took a campaign out in uh, state elections. This is in the last couple of months. Uh, state elections happened in Madhya Pradesh last week. We're expecting the results on Monday, I think it is. And um, they effectively pledged, the, 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 there are a number of um, constituencies that are, have a very high proportion of gas and water affected people who pledged their votes to any uh, candidate who was going to uh, promise to pursue uh, fresh compensation awards and, and to help you know, uh, stimulate the curative petition. So they did get some pledges, but it remains to be seen what happens as a result. You know, in, in 2008, um, a group of 200, 150 survivors walked all the way to Delhi uh, on foot, Padiatra, um, uh, set up camp in Jantamanta in Delhi. Um, took actions against the Prime Minister's residence, chained themselves to his fence, um, met, uh, did lots of lobbying with national politicians, managed to get a private meeting with 
uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh at the time, who promised them uh, to their faces a national commission on Bhopal that would be empowered, made up of relevant experts in, con in uh, conference with the survivor organisations, and this body would be empowered to intervene in environmental, social, economic rehabilitation schemes in the city rather than leaving it to what's proven to be a very corrupt local administration at the state level. And uh, so he made this face-to-face -face promise. Um, there was a meeting of ministers on Bhopal that created a preliminary document and then nothing else happened. Uh, and that's now, you know, over 10 years ago. And of course that party is long out of power now. Uh, well, it's potentially positive, but I must provide some <laughs> depressing context to that. Yeah. So the, the curative petition that was initiated by Congress party government in 2010, it received one hearing, um, uh, or two hearings, one to, to allow it to go forward, and then an initial hearing in 2011. And uh, so arguments were presented, it's been pending ever since. So we heard uh, yesterday that the national government, the current national government, has filed an urgent application for hearing in that case. It had been listed for hearing a number of times and then hadn't been heard for whatever reason. So that's positive on the one hand, but on the other hand, in the intervening years, um, the companies Dow and Union Carbide have submitted a series of arguments uh, in paper form which uh, the, the advocate that we work with in Delhi who's looked at the, this paperwork says it's, it's a pile kind of you know, three or four feet off the floor, and the Indian government, to support its own case, has filed around 25 pages in response. So that there is this incredible inequality of arms in terms of the arguments that have been brought forward to support that uh, legal initiative, which anyway was a was a long shot because it depends upon uh, case law that was established in 2002 uh, that has only been. Um, successfully pursued, I think, on two occasions. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a shot in the dark, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a major case. It's provided a forum, actually, for the survivor organisations to present a lot of the background uh, history that had not, not been brought before the courts before, so I'm going to make public documents of those uh, issues. How, how the various survivors Uh, they, they have weekly meetings in Bhopal. There are, uh, I think, five groups that, we, that, that meet weekly. There are two other make quite large survivor organisations that they coordinate with uh, when there are important issues to address as well. Um, and you know, international supporters effectively coordinate with the grassroots organisations under the rubric of the ICJB, the International Campaign for Justice in Bhopal, which uh, at the moment is, is staffed entirely by uh, a loose network of volunteers. Oh, thank you. No, thank you very much. Oh, for coming in.